Monster Raising Game. A very self-explanatory name for a subgenre of games where you the player, and make sure you pay attention because this is very complex, raise monsters. This type of game has been around for a long time, even way back in 1987, the original Megami Tensei, which eventually spawned the Shin Megami Tensei series in Persona, featured you recruiting and using demons even all the way back then. And going forward a bit, even the already influential Dragon Quest series in 1992 with Dragon Quest V would feature a monster raising simulator too, with the ability to recruit Dragon Quest psychotic monsters, which would then go on to spawn an entire side series. And it's very easy to tell why this type of gameplay was introduced. Monster collecting and raising adds an inherent replayability and customization to it that most games would dream to have. You can also even begin to just break it down to collecting and using your favorites, which adds another personal level to it that, once again, most types of games would kill for. Now, creating a bunch of unique and diverse monsters takes a lot of work, which is why this type of game isn't the most common, but when you do play one, you can feel the care put into many of the creatures and mechanics featured within each game. But well, you probably already know what monster raisers are all about because you know what the poster child is. Pokemon, it's probably the first thing you thought of. It's the most popular example and arguably has a chokehold over the whole subgenre. To the point where many other monster raising games can be seen as clones or ripoffs. None such as Notorious is Digimon, one series that I always found to be mistreated and simply regarded as a Pokemon ripoff trying to get that sweet Pikachu money. Digimon, right from the beginning, was compared to Pokemon. It was about a group of young kids pairing up with monsters with the ability to evolve and who go on adventures. Both series had an anime, card games, tons of merch, and of course video games. Despite any differences they may have had, to most people, Digimon was just some Pokemon clone. And in fact, even to this day, I commonly see Pokemon designs people don't like described as Digimon. But was it actually a clone? Well, Digimon started as something called a virtual pet. These were male-oriented versions of the popular Tamagotchis, basically simple little handhelds where you took care of a creature and how well you did decided what it turned into, whether you took care of it well and it grew big and strong, or you neglected it and it died. Either way, after a certain amount of time, you'd have to start over with a new baby anyway to try out new things and to see what you get. It was less about the death and more about the raising of the creature itself, the adventure and not the destination, if you will. And as I mentioned, the Digimon ones were developed towards a male audience, and as such, it opted for more monstrous and cool designs and had a more gameplay-oriented focus, to the point where these began to have built-in multiplayer functions. You could connect your V-Pet to your friends and put your own Digimon against theirs. Today, multiplayer is such a standardized, accepted thing, but back in the day, having a way to pitch your monsters against your friends must have been incredibly cool. And this idea of raising a single monster has continued on through the future media the Digimon V-Pet spawned. As mentioned, in the anime, most characters are paired with a single Digimon they'd have to care for, and when it came for Digimon to start getting video games, they opted for this style first. The first technical Digimon game was called Digital Monsters Version S. It was just the V-Pet, but on a much bigger scale, with better visuals, more Digimon, and things to do. There's not much about this game out there due to its age and the fact it was on the Sega Saturn, not the most popular system to come out for lack of a better term. For many fans of the video games, what's truly considered to be the first game and the one that set up the course they would take is Digimon World on the PlayStation 1. Much like the anime, it featured a kid getting transferred to the digital world, getting a partner, and needing to go on adventures all throughout the island they landed on to ultimately save it from an evil force. This game is definitely aged, but it has a very primal charm to it, especially with its aesthetics. The digital world is this combination of the natural and digital, much like the monsters that inhabit it. It's a visual design all its own, and it's very easy to get sucked into and enjoy it. And despite its age, I come back to it every once in a while because of its unique gameplay characteristics. Much like the V-Pet it spawned from, in Digimon World you need to take care of your partner and how well you do determines how strong it gets and what it turns into, and eventually it'll die and return to a baby for the cycle to start all over, albeit with higher stats so you get stronger in the new cycle. This type of monster raising type gameplay isn't something you get from any other series, and it's one of the reasons I do come back to it because it is such a different change of pace. And I love the feeling you get from raising up a cool Digimon. And for years, Digimon World will remain as the primary game of this style, as the series tried out something new with almost every game. Kind of like Sonic the Hedgehog, and sometimes with the same amount of success. But in 2012 on the PSP, Namco Bandai, the creators of the Digimon games, finally returned to the style with a spiritual successor, Redigitized. The game was never released over here, but it did get a very dedicated fan translation, so if you want to play it, that's certainly an option. But for those of you who do like to support the official release, or want something a bit more tangible, this style of monster raising gameplay was revisited once again in 2016 with Digimon World Next Order. Originally on the Vita, but brought over to us on the PS4 because you don't leave your infant on a sinking ship. 
Digimon World Next Order features a very similar premise of you being dragged into the digital world to explore and save it, but this time instead of just raising one Digimon, there are two of them, thanks. The digital world is currently being attacked by these Digimon called Machindramon, causing the Digimon to scatter in the once great hub town of Flotia to become a shell of its former self, only being inhabited by babies and Jigimon, one elderly one. You and your Wonder Twins are tasked with fighting off the Machindramon, figure out what's going on, and bring Digimon back to the city. But, before you do any of that, you gotta hit the gym, because you got babies. Attempting to fight off a Machindramon, your Digimon die and have to start all over, and before you even think about setting out, you'll need to train them up again. Each time you train at the gym, your Digimon can increase one of their primary stats, and an hour will go by. After enough time has passed, they'll Digivolve into a stronger form based off the stats and conditions present. Part of the fun of this type of game is going with the flow because until the late game you can't entirely control which path a Digimon can take and they have plenty of evolutionary options. Every time I play the original Redigitize in this game I end up with different Digimon and it spices up and makes each playthrough different. Now as you go up the evolutionary tree the requirements get tougher and tougher to hit with conditions like battles done, Digimon's weight, specific stats, and so on. So even getting one to evolve that high can be a lot of work. But that limitation further leads into each playthrough being different. For example, I had to force my Woodmon to evolve into Mummymon because that was the only choice I had for him to evolve into Ultimate that I could reach at my current level. Did I expect to get Mummymon? Did I expect to get even Woodmon? No, but now that I do, it made this playthrough more memorable because now I'll remember this playthrough as the one where I had Mummymon and Woodmon. And in the future, I'll look back at this adventure with the Digimon I had, just like with my previous ones, and remember the fun times I had with them. But I'm getting way too ahead of myself. You just trained your little guys up and, well, now they're understandably hungry. Okay, what do you do? Well, obviously you go to your meat farm. Where else do you think meat comes from? Every day you can get food from the farm to feed your Digimon, and by recruiting certain Digimon, the amount can be increased. Food can also be found throughout the overworld and even bought in some places, but since they eat, it has to come out sometime, right? So eventually in your training, they'll have to go to the bathroom. Thankfully there's one right there, and bathrooms are spread across the digital world. And now, after all this eating, training, and pooping, they'll want to naturally rest. Digimon can go to sleep and recover all the health and stamina they've lost and are ready to fight again for a new day. Now this cycle, while simple, creates a true feeling of you needing to care for your digital monster. And so the natural question is, do I really need to do this? Failing to take care of your digital monster can lead to some dire consequences. Examples are such as them dying earlier, losing their health, becoming weaker, or turning into literal shit. Digimon was really just such an underappreciated series, huh? So not only do you have a natural sense to take care of your creature, but you have an obligation to do it because it'll turn out disastrous if you don't. And this creates a natural bond between you and these, well, digital monsters. You get attached and you want to take care of them and see them grow and become the best they can be. But alright, you got into the swing of raising your Digimon, and now you've trained him up to the Rookie or Champion level. You probably want to head out by now into the actual world, rather than just sit in the gym all day. Beyond Flodia is the digital world proper, filled with tons of different areas to explore and Digimon to fight and recruit. For the first while, you're going to be out here mainly exploring and recruiting which Digimon you can. The main story of the game progresses only once you reach certain prosperity levels. Increased by recruiting more Digimon, so searching and recruiting will be your main focus throughout the game. And how you recruit them depends on each one. Some Digimon will only need to be talked to, but many will require you to do something for them or just settle with a good old fight. Combat starts when you run into a random Digimon or initiate it through something like a recruitment. Your Digimon will be sent out to fight against them in real time and will do their best to fight, block, and dodge to win. I do like this type of gameplay where Digimon go out and do what they can to fight. It drives home the fact that once again, they're your pets and are alive and they'll do their best to win, even if they aren't the smartest. But don't worry about that last part because you're there to help. Every couple of seconds you can shout out to your Digimon and these will earn you order points. These can be used to help your Digimon block, choose a specific attack, or even build up enough points for a signature powerful move. By timing your shouts for when the Digimon attacks, or is attacked, you can actually earn more points, so there is a little bit of skill involved. What this means is that you do have a certain level of control over the fights, even though your Digimon are autonomous and act on their own too. It gives a great feeling of owner and pet relationships that this game is just good at establishing already. And as your Digimon get stronger, they will actually proportionally get smarter and fight better. And while you still will contribute, it is cool to see them getting more competent as time goes on. It makes you feel like the work you put into raising them pays off. But okay, you learn how to play the game, you explore these areas, and you even find and recruit some Digimon. What do they do for you? Just sit there and eat Digi meat? 
Every Digimon you recruit does something. Tentomon opens a shop, meaning you can begin to buy items straight from Floaty instead of needing to find them or buy them out in the world. Bergermon allows you to fly to any area you've been to for a cost, and Numamon gives you portable toilets to sort of bypass the need to find a bathroom. And so on. Basically, the Digimon you recruit are all upgrades that offer you more and more. It feels great that with every step of the adventure, you are constantly unlocking more and more things to do to help you out. And eventually, Floatia will recruit enough Digimon to expand it, meaning you not only get a gameplay indication of progress, but a nice visual one too. And even then, at this point, you can begin to upgrade the facilities of Digimon you have already, and you can get even more value out of them. Just like you get a sense of growth from raising your Digimon, you get a sense of growth from raising your city bigger and bigger as you get more bonuses with every Digimon you recruit. But once again, we come back to that similar question from before. Do you really need all these bonuses, or are they just kind of there to be nice? Digimon World Next Order is really, really hard. This game will push you and break you, and unless you use everything to your advantage, properly raise your Digimon, and manage your time well and push back against it, you're gonna have a bad time. Let's start at the most pressing point, the enemies themselves. This is a very stat-heavy game. No duh, right Robert? It's an RPG, but it's less like, oh, a little bit at a time, and more like a thousand at a time. It's less like a slanted line for difficulty progression, and more like a straight line up. I'm talking having a boss who isn't that hard, like the first Machine Dramon boss, but then giving him a 2,000 base power attack that will one-shot any Digimon you have at that point in the game. To top this off, if your Digimon take too much damage in a fight, they'll get injured or sick, meaning you'll have to buy an appropriate healing item, which are expensive and rare in the beginning of the game. Always save, you never know when your Digimon's gonna get injured, you never know when you're gonna fight something that's too much for you, and if your Digimon gets sick and die, well that just kinda sucks, and okay look, I am hamming it up a little bit, and it's not that hard. But more than any other Digimon game I've played, hell, more than any other RPG I've played, this game will spike its difficulty to no end, which requires you to push back against it. Okay, where do we start pushing back then? Well, if you actually want to use your skill points. As you play through the game, you'll get these skill points, and they can be used for a lot of useful abilities. The most pressing of which is the guard command. I have no idea why they made this something you had to buy. Remember that Machine Dramon fight I mentioned with a 2000 base power move? Yeah, this is how you survive that. At least to the game's credit, it's not that expensive and hard to get, and I think most people have the sense to buy it anyway. And further to this game's credit, a lot of its skills are genuinely helpful. You ever play a game where you feel like the skill points you use aren't that useful? Not here. I'm talking longer lifespans for your Digimon, better stats when they're reborn, better item drops, you know, the works. And once again, we go back to that idea of everything in this game goes towards growth. And in a way, this game's raw difficulty makes everything you get more worth it. All the Digimon you recruit and all the skills you get are genuinely useful to you because you have to use them in order to succeed. But you'll find that even with optimized gym training, even with all the skills you get, even with all the Digimon you recruit, you'll push and the game will push back. So what do you do? Perish? Suffer? Trade in the game to GameStop for a dollar and a gumball? No, you fight. You'll begin to notice that you'll get actual stat gains from fighting itself, and while this is low for most battles, you'll begin to think, hey, is there a way for me to get big gains out of this? And that answer is yes. Fighting strong enemies or enemies of a higher level, especially as rookies, will give you a huge stat boost, allowing you to get more gains faster than what you could ever imagine at the gym. I recommend looking at a video or trying around for different Digimon, as you will reach a point where your newborn rookies will be strong enough to fight some of the early game champion level Digimon. And whenever you reach this point in next order, it feels unbelievable because at this point your newborns will rapidly surpass their previous end of life power. It's so crazy and insane. This is one of the draws of the game. If you're a crackhead who gets enjoyment from seeing big number go up, this will absolutely satisfy you. At the gym, you'll only get 20, 30 in a stat per hour, but fighting against these champions, you will get 20, 30 in all stats per battle. But this can also be annoying because this takes a lot longer than gym training and requires more focus. Now it's absolutely more rewarding, but to many people I can imagine taking several hours purely to train up your Digimon to only then begin making progress again not being the most appealing prospect. Especially because sometimes this game likes to waste your time, some of the recruitments will require you to do things that you'll need to invest time in. Now that doesn't sound bad at a glance, but keep in mind this is a very time management focused game and even losing a day can feel like a lot, especially if that's the day your partners decide to die. 
My least favorite of these is Seedramon, who needs a specific fish, and it took me upwards of a day and a half to fish it out. In a game where I'm thinking at all times on what I'm going to be doing next, this can be really annoying. Not a deal breaker, but it contributes more to that halted progress I've been talking about. But even with all the time you're putting into building up your town, recruiting Digimon, training your own Digimon, and getting all your skills, you'll push further and further, and after all that, you still lose. Now, is this truly the end? Do I finally now return this game to GameStop? No, because you have one last trick up your sleeve before you return the game. Once they reach Ultimate and Mega their higher forms, your Digimon can come together and merge into a stronger one with the combined stats of both, with J-Pop blasting in the background. And it is so stupid hype. Having what was an impossible fight become a more fair one-on-one -on -one with your superpowered Digimon fighting against their superpowered fighting Digimon, it is just, it never gets old. Especially because this will happen to people on accident. There's a chance for this to happen upon your Digimon losing, and whenever this happens, it just, it's wild. We are just straight anime now. The downside is you can only do this once per day, but there will be a point where this is likely the only way you can beat the bosses, meaning you'll be time-gated further on progression. It's not well designed at all, in fact, the whole difficulty curve as a whole, as you can tell, is pretty out of whack, but it's just so cool and it definitely leaves a lasting impact, especially on the final act of the game where it's basically just your Omnimon versus the world. But that's kind of what Next Order is, it's a game chock full of meaningful progression versus haphazard difficulty that will force you to use everything you get and really plan your next move at all times. It's a unique game, one that is nowhere near well designed, but nonetheless, charming and worth giving a try in its own right. I definitely didn't skip anything about it at all. I guess now is the time to end- oh yeah, there's a story. Once you recruit enough Digimon, story chapters will unlock at intervals, and honestly speaking, they're irrelevant. Basically, the Machine Dramon outbreaks are all the work of someone behind the scenes, and you beat them up and everything goes back to normal. The story in this game doesn't matter much, and honestly speaking, only really exists to put more characters on the box to make it more appealing. These guys show up, throw up their backstories, and then basically do one or two things, and that's it. Now to their credit, their backstories aren't bad, but this just isn't a story-focused game. They don't get much, if any, time to develop and even act as characters. The main brunt of your time will be exploring, recruiting, and training. The story should have had more to do with that rather than be some unconnected machine drum on plot. Now the previous two games' stories in this style weren't perfect either, but at least they tried a little more to be in line with what you're actually going to be doing, rather than some typical RPG plot which just sticks out like a sore thumb. But still, even at the end of the day, with a poor story and a difficulty curve that is out of whack, I still find myself coming back to this game because it is so unique and interesting. Raising a Digimon like a pet and having to take care of it and getting rewarded for doing a great job against the perilous world and its enemies. I definitely made this review sound a bit positive overall, but my previous scripts were a bit too negative. I wanted to show off some of this game's strong points like its massively rewarding progression and unique raising style while acknowledging its more weak design elements like its difficulty curve. I can I not recommend this game to everyone because it is the type of game where you have to optimize and put in your all and fight an uphill battle, but it's such an interesting experience you can't get anywhere else and I think that does have merit. If you're a monster raising fan looking for a new interesting game or you're just someone out there saying yeah I can raise some Digimon, I'd say give this game a look. You can usually find it these days for like 20 bucks and I think that's a good deal for what you get. But if this isn't to your taste but you still want to have some Digimon goodness in your life, stick around. I'm well underway working on covering the Digimon. Digimon Cyber Sleuth duology. Games that are much friendlier to a wider audience, and it might seem weird that I started out with this one, but I think it was a better introduction to the history of Monster Razors and the series itself being so connected to the base premise of the V-Pet. I also think this game deserved to have the spotlight put on it because it's not as well known as the Cyber Sleuth duology, and I think more people should look at it and think about trying it out. But that's enough for today, why don't you subscribe and see what type of Digimon shenanigans I get into next time, and what I'll do beyond that. I have a lot of fun projects in mind, and maybe leave a comment to ask you for something you'd like to see covered, Monster Razor or not, or if you learn something new or can even teach me something new. That's all for today, stay safe, stay happy, and have a fantastic day.